Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today. The title of today's webinar is how to use the power of attribute based controls in your SAP environment. Our presenters today are Greg Wendt and Adi Goka, um, who will introduce themselves in just a moment. But first, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. My name is Stephanie Anderson. I'm the Global Webinar Manager here at Pathlock. Um, and before we go any further, if you have any audio issues during this webinar, click on preferences in that audio. From there, you can check to see if you're using the appropriate audio device. You can also click on the play sound to check if you can hear the sound coming through your speaker. This presentation will be approximately 45 minutes. There will be a Q&A session following the presentation. So please type any questions you have into the Q&A chat box for our speakers to answer at the end of the event. To prevent background noise, everyone is on mute. And with that, I'll turn the time over to Greg and Audie to introduce themselves. Thank you. So as she said, my name is Greg Wendt. I'm an executive director here at Pathlock. I kind of come from the merger with the Appsian team. So I've been doing this for about eight and a half years. Before that, I was in oil and gas retail and higher head as an enterprise architect for ERP systems. And I started with ERP back in the late 90s as everybody was trying to uh, move off the mainframe before uh, the year 2000 gig. So Adi? Yeah. Um... Hi, hi guys. Uh, this is Adi Goka, this side. Uh, I'm a senior solutions engineer here for Pathlock, uh, also a GRC advisor. Uh, I have about 21 years of experience in the SAP GRC controls world and also uh, uh, designing, uh, architecting, and maintaining uh, SAP GRC systems and SAP security for uh, diverse uh, SAP systems uh, from CRM all the way to SRM uh, and others. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Back to you, Rick. Perfect. You'll hear from Adi a little bit later as well. A um, little bit about um, who we are and why are we talking to you today. So Pathlock, we really are the market leader in application security and controls automation. So with the uh, merging of all the different companies now, we have over 500 employees worldwide. We've got over 1,300 customers worldwide as well. And we have native and cloud-based solutions. We support about 100, over 140 different applications. You can see the, from our customer list there as well as some of our partners and we'll go in and you'll see some of um, what we're able to do today um, so we're going to be showing a little bit more of the native solution today from a product flow so let's go ahead and jump into um, you know, how we're able to do this or what we're able to do. So Pathlock really gives you the ability to have 360 degree protection of all of your applications, data, users, and processes. We do this um, multiple different ways, but really it starts with your applications because we're able to connect into through those 140 different connectors, we're able to connect into multiple different application sets, whether it's ERP, whether it's in the cloud or on-prem, you know, whether it's a legacy system. So let's say you have a, a specific system that's old and, you know, it's required for certain access or for integrating with different um, applications or, or just communicating on your network, for example, and then also your ERP system. So we've, we can have real-time connections into all of those different application sets. Also, we can look at all of your users and we can govern that user access through implementing, you know, access analysis or doing user access reviews. We're going to pull all of that into the Pathlock system and be able to tell you what those users have access to. This is really what I like to um, talk about is the can do. The can do is, all right, this user has been giving these, given these authorizations within these systems. So this is what they can do. One of the real big challenges, though, is how do you shift and move that into a did do? Because that's the real differentiator there is can do. There's other people out there that can do that. But now when we're looking at monitoring those transactions and seeing all that activity, it really shifts into more of a did do analysis. So that did do allows us to know, oh, this particular user not only has the ability to, let's say, um, create a vendor and also pay a vendor and those types of things. OK, well, that's a red flag. You know, they shouldn't be able to do these two combinations. So, you know, did they actually do any of those scenarios? So we can we can tie those events back to that authorization that was first done. So 
really helps bring in the effect of understanding what your what your threat vectors are and what your risk looks like because that's ultimately the goal is to protect and quantify your risk you need to understand inside of my applications what type of risk profile do i have am i able to do any threat threat detection any sort of you know security and um testing and then also compliance testing. What am I doing for GDPR, SOX, all of those other types of compliance issues that I have to deal with as an organization as a whole? And you really need to be able to do this all the time. So, you know, somebody could be looking at this data quarterly, monthly, annually, or in an ad hoc perspective. But, you know, really, if you're not collecting it and comparing it, looking at it all the time, you're not going to be able to answer give that answer to the end user all of the time. So through that 360 degree protection, it, it really allows us to be able to do that. As a whole, um, Pathlock can do multiple different things. Um, we're gonna touch a little bit on today with the process controls in the middle. So when you look at access governance, that's really your GRC, it's your role design, redesign. You guys can read through all of the different boxes and, and buckets if you want to, but it's really about compliant provisioning and, and, and handling all of those processes for you and making sure that we are doing separation of duties and risk analysis those user access reviews and certifications you know a lot of organizations now might be even bringing those into monthly um you know some have have done it at a more of a quarterly type pace um you know depending upon the user group that they're actually looking at i've been talking to a few organizations here lately that are really pushing those those high privileged users into you know monthly certifications which is a lot you know, that's 12 times a year that you're going to have to be doing these things. And then also what happens with, you know, privileged or temporary access management. So when we get into those process controls, really that's about, uh, that's where we get the transaction monitoring to understand what those users are doing. Also data masking. So inside of your, your SAP system, we can target, we can, we can use attribute based access controls to mask data, depending upon what's important, where that user is accessing the system from. It's really where, you know, a real power of those attribute based access controls comes in and that also does uh, affect how you're going to control enforcement and, and transaction blocking and with that we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that today as well um, and the dynamic authorizations to be able to you know here's my my security roles and my authorizations that I have as a normal user but through that attribute based layer I can then apply and really come into effect whether somebody should or shouldn't work with that particular either the data or maybe the transaction action as a whole based upon what those attributes are telling telling us you know how that user is accessing the system and then single sign on and multi-factor authentication when we get into cyber security management this is a whole nother layer specific to your sap system so we can do vulnerability management we can do code scanning and come in and look at that we can also do continuous control monitoring um, and detection and response what are we going to do when we find these types of scenarios and then obviously we've got logging and integration with uh you know sim you know, security information and event management systems as well. So as a holistic approach, these are all of the different things we can bring to bear on your SAP solution. So when we talk about what we're going to address today, um, how to enhance and extend the SAP role-based access controls. So from an agenda perspective, um, why can't an SAP role really do it all? Why do we need to look at attributes? Why do we need additional controls? You know, how can, how can we enhance and extend the roles cost efficient of effectively um, and then we're also going to see a demo today so and then a summary in any q a so if you do have any questions during the session today just use the go to webinar control panel it's normally on the right hand side of your screen just submit a question there and i'll make sure that either myself or adi gets gets you the answer to that question as well if there's something that you don't want to ask you can always info or email us at info at pathlock.com as well so why is securing the data so hard and why is it so important from the organizational's perspective? Uh, looking at it, 27.4% of the annual is the annual number of data security breaches suffered by enter enterprises. It, it, 
you know, has increased continually from 21, 20 to 21. It's going to continue to increase. Um, there's lots of moving pieces inside of all of these different organizations. You've got very diverse architectures on-prem, in the cloud, you know, employees at home, on the road, um, all throughout the globe. It makes it a challenge to secure your environment. It's difficult from an organizational perspective even to differentiate what is considered within your network and out of your network, you know, to really understand all of the bits and pieces and everything that's flowing between all of those places, you know, and now all of a sudden when you talk about some of the compliance uh, that's required, GDPR or security, incident response, any of those types of scenarios, you can see the costs are increasing with that as well. Um, $10,000 is the average cost of compliance per employee. Why is it that, you know, ENY reported that GDPR compliance alone averages 156 million per company in the Fortune 500. That's expensive, but it's important. It's important to understand what's happening to your data. Who's touching your data? Who's accessing it? You know, what are they doing with that data? You know, and, and it's interesting because I was working on my MBA and in Europe when they were when SOX was being implemented in, in the early 2000s, for example. And it was it was really unique to go over and spend quite a bit of time with some organizations um, while that was going on. One of the things that I've taken away from that probably uh, mo that I find most interesting trying to figure out how to phrase that. But to find it most interesting is the fact of if you look at how long it took somebody to be um, prosecuted or found guilty. Look at the differences between SOX and GDPR, for example. GDPR was very quick. There's already been lots of fines issued on GDPR. Sarbanes took a long time before somebody actually went to prison for it, a long time. So two very dynamic and different laws and, and compliance issues. Um, and, and really there's a lot of states, a lot of governments, a lot of countries that are now implementing the same type of scenario as GDPR. It might be GDPR light, could be GDPR plus a few other options. You know, So lots of different countries are doing the exact same thing to try to protect the information of, of, you know, the people who live there. Um, you know, and really it boils down to 78% of the companies surveyed believe these figures will continue to increase. I don't know how they won't, in all honesty. The, there is nothing that points that these are going to go down. And why is that important for your SAP system? Because your SAP system has data everywhere. They're designed to make your organization more efficient and effective at what they do. And they're also designed to share information between all of the different processes and, and business transactions so that you can work very efficiently as an organization because of that consistency of how that data looks, is shared, and moves around the organization. So all of this data is in one big, large system. So you've got lots of sensitive information, lots of financial information, critical business processes all tied into one place in hundreds of transactions and thousands of fields. So all of that is contained in one particular place and everybody wants access to it. You know, you've got all of your secret sauce in one particular area. So why is that a challenge for something like role-based access control? So when we look at roles, you know, they're a foundation for managing the information security. Uh, they can be a challenge to administer and a burden for maintenance. Of, you know, there's some organizations that I've talked to that literally have tens of thousands of roles. How do you even know what to do with tens of thousands of roles? You know, I talked to talked to somebody the other day that actually said they just create a new role for everybody that needs access to the system. Eek! You know, that's that's scary. You know, that you're going to proliferate roles at a at a pace that's crazy. You know, so how do you get it down to understanding this is what a role should consist of? It needs to be concise, it needs to be clean, and it needs to be very bulletproof. You know, and that's where if you've got the discipline to go through that, roles can be can excel. They excel at SOD reporting, um, data changed and theft potential because the roles are going to con control what that user has access to. Um, they're also organic to the platform, so they're going to be designed in. You know, you've got specific roles in SAP, you've got specific roles in Active Directory or your identity management system, as well as any ER any other ERP system that you may have, like EBS, JD Edwards, or, or PeopleSoft, for example. And they always need recertification. And it's a challenge that many organizations don't really like to deal with, but it's something that you have to work with. Where the roles really do struggle is the enforcement of, of SOD. You can say that's kind of where it goes back to that did do, or can do and did do. You know, 
the role can, you know, it says, well, they can do this, but how do you enforce that? You know, how do you enforce the data changes or theft prevention? Um, and that's one of the reasons why when we think about the bad guys and how they target these systems, a lot of times they'll target those end users because if they can get a high privileged user, then they can go do all of these things anyway. You know, so if you're talking about adjusting entitlements quickly, you know, based on regulations, some of the roles have a challenge with that. Very static roles um, caused a lot of issues with, with the whole shift of what happened with COVID, for example, and everybody working from home. So that's where the policy and business strategy alignment was a challenge. All of a sudden, everybody got pushed home and it became very difficult to control access. It was chaotic. And the bad actors knew that and that's why they followed COVID around the globe <coughs> as an attack vector and really hit organizations through all of those times. So how do we enhance and extend the roles cost efficiently? Um, we can do this through... Um, You've got to build on the roles. Really what you're doing is you're going to leverage what the roles. So it kind of goes back to the old pyramid. You know, the roles are the bottom. It, it's key to enabling all of the other attributes moving forward. So you're going to leverage those roles that are already existing in your system that give you the controls of what that user is already doing. Um, what we're going to do then is we're going to extend on top of that bringing in additional attributes. So that's where we're moving into that attribute-based control model. And it allows you to do multiple different things. You know, you can have uh, attributes about the user. You can have attributes about the data that they're working with. You can also have attributes about the transaction. What specifically about this transaction do I want to know? And then also you've got rules on top of that. So when you look at that all holistically and as you start moving up the pyramid, what that allows you to do is really define and refine how users are going to work with your data sets and your transactions. So when we start at the roles, we've got good role-based access controls. Now when we bring in those attributes of the users and the data, that gives us attribute-based data controls, which that can then give us dynamic data masking, policy-based access. We can, we can put in different rules and effects to maybe stop load downloading of data or even sensitive data mapping, for example. All of those things can occur in there. When we start bringing in the attributes of of the transaction in and of itself, now all of a sudden we can make decisions whether or not that user should have access to that transaction, bringing in all of those attributes together. So it allows us to know, oh, let's block it. Oh, let's allow them. We're gonna monitor this particular transaction at that, at that point. So, and then when you build your rules up at the top, this is really where you align your business rules and your policies. And it gives you the control at the higher level to understand this is what my business policy is. Maybe my business policy is you can't download data or you can't do this when you're accessing in certain ways. All right, well now we can have rules and we can have policies that will actually really affect that in my SAP system, allowing me to align my business policies and procedures and actually really effectively implement those within my system. Three key requirements to efficiently extend role-based access controls. One is it's got to be easy to maintain and configure. It's just a must. And there's also got to be a one-to-many enforcement of how we're going to be able to do this. And really dynamic protection. That's the that's really where you're going to come in and see. It's really all about those attributes, you know, because and it's aligned with the authorization checks that are already there. So all of those things are going to build together and it's going to allow you to really have an efficient system to protect your SAP system. So when we talk about system-wide enforcement, what do we mean there? Uh, one is it's really easy to do because it's a centralized policy. So you can have that one-to-many on a single rule set. So it'll, it is enforceable in both tables and the SAP queries, for example, as well. So when you're talking about attribute-based access controls, um, you know it, it really allows you to be able to enforce all of these policies across a complex landscape. It, it allows you to really develop something that's going to help protect your system because you can use the broadest array uh, or logic and attributes to really understand how people are accessing your system, what they're doing inside of your system, and it allows you to easily adapt to change without reconfiguration. So, you know, going back to the COVID example of everybody moving, you know, to home, for example, you know, that would have been very easy. 
you know, from a security perspective when you're using an attribute-based access control system. Why? Because it's going to take in more context to understand what those users are doing inside your system. And that's really where that dynamic protection comes from because it's taking policy-based and combining those attributes of the attribute-based access control and business rules all together. So it brings your security into real world. So all of the context and all of the scenarios that you're gonna come up with can really be defined and built around because it allows you to really compare and bring in all of those different pieces of information to decide how I want my user to work with my transaction set. So in the scenario of you know, access, for example, you know, how are they coming in? Where are they coming in from? What time of day are they coming in from? Data attributes, what data are they working with? Is this private data? Is it financial data? You know, the user attributes, what type of user are they? Um, you know, that it does that affect how they access the system? So that's where it really boils down having a dynamic system. Now, all of a sudden, you can have a policy that says, hey, mask all the PII of users in the UK. Why? Because of GDPR. Great. OK, cool. We can do that. Becomes really difficult to do that without having all of the attributes to understand. All right, here's the user. But what data are they working with? Maybe they're working with data from outside of the UK. Does that need to be masked? All of those things need to be understood and put together to really build and go back to that pyramid of understanding how does this affect my system. So, and then also a native integration. So as I was talking about earlier, um, this is going to be one of our native solutions because it does touch inside of the SAP so, um, solution. So we're going to be, we have a plugin that sits within your SAP system and it's got a rules engine. So as the user is going to make a request and go back to the devices, all of these things are going to be plugged in. The nice part about it is, you can do all of this without having to implement additional customizations to your SAP system. And when you're talking about how it does the controls, it really is doing it at the UI layer. So it's making that decision to either mask data, protect a transaction, not allowing the user to access that uh, you know, transaction, all at the UI layer. So we're not changing things under the scenes or, or behind the scenes. So when you're talking about updating maintenance from SAP, all of those types of things, it becomes much easier. It's far more streamlined because it is enforcing the policy in line. So there's no additional network hops. There's not a proxy server. And, you know, that that does, you know, there's no impact on security from that perspective as well. And this is a SAP certified solution, which means that it has gone through the validation. And with that means that it actually does meet performance requirements that are set around that to have that certified solution. Let's talk real quickly about a couple of different use cases, and then I'm going to hand over to uh, Adi, and he can go through and and really show us some demo information. Uh, you know, going through some of these scenarios. So when we're talking about a specific T code, let's say PA20, where we're just going to display all of the HR master data, there's a lot of sensitive information and a lot of data within this transaction as a whole. Um, when I look at an attribute-based model and how does this affect what I can do with that transaction as a whole, I've got multiple different pieces of information that I can bring to bear on whether or not that user should be able to work with all of the data, part of the data, or none of the data, or you know, really not the transaction as a whole. So when they're in the office, an area that you trust the most, why? Because it's probably a corporate resource on your network, you should trust that person, you know? So at that particular point, they can have access to all of the data. Um, when we're looking at um, the, uh, you know, remote access users. So all of a sudden now something has changed to where that user is remote. Maybe they're in a remote office, could be a re remote at home. It could be anything like that. Um, how do we want the data to represent now? Do we want them to see everything? Do we want them to protect it? What makes the most amount of sense? So in that scenario, maybe we're gonna mask out PII data, such as national ID, social security, something like that, maybe birth dates, you know, pick the data that you're interested in. It could be any PII. And then also after hours. So maybe you have a policy that says, you know, after hours access isn't allowed for certain functionality. So at that particular point, you know, this user has the ability to access the transaction normally, but because it's after hours access, we're going to go ahead and stop that. So they're actually going to get a message that tells them they can't access the transaction. Meanwhile, under the scenes, none of their role-based access has changed. All of, the, all of this is occurring at that attribute-based layer across the system. 
So if we flip over and look at it from a financials aspect, you know, supply chain, for example, uh, looking at sales order data, uh, VA03, same type of scenario. So as the user accesses that T code, they're going to be able to, sitting at their desk, access and do whatever they need to do because they're in office. They're in that trusted environment. Remote access, like I said, either a remote office, working from home, coffee shop, something like that at that particular point, maybe we're gonna substitute certain data. So maybe sales price is different because we don't want that data to be displayed outside of the organization. And then also we may be going back to, uh, you know, the after hours example, you know, at that particular point, you know, at midnight, we're not gonna allow this to happen. We don't want somebody coming into the system, you know, um, doing things that they shouldn't be doing after hours. So with that, I'm actually going to, uh, stop presenting here real quick and i am going to um hand over to adi so he can do um a demo and walk into additional information on this so adi you should be able to present now sure thanks thanks Greg. appreciate it so um and uh welcome everybody to the webinar what greg was talking about the attribute based access controls uh, I'm going to pick off from there and then take you guys and show you guys the guts of the system. Basically, uh, what enables these and how do we represent them in the system, how PathLock solution uh, works with most SAP uh, environments and how we, can, uh, uh, how we can leverage those to provide value in this changing uh, era of, uh, of regulatory compliance as well as uh, threats and, and the measures that we place against those threats to safeguard ourselves, right? So uh, real quickly, let me quickly share my screen. Um, and uh, and Greg, can you see my screen? Yep, we're good. Okay, perfect. So uh, real quickly, guys, I'm gonna rely on the trusted SAP uh, GUI screens here uh, to highlight some of the behaviors here. But some of the, uh, most of the, uh, stuff here that I show you is going to be uh, going to be treated exactly the same across maybe an S4 environment or, or a Fiori environment, uh, which we also support. So the way that the solution works is it's a, it's a SAP certified add-on uh, that is installed on top of your system, uh, very similar to what you would do um, via a Saint transaction code if, uh, if there's anybody from basis in the house. Uh, uh, so, uh, so that's what I'm going to show you. Uh, I have an ECC system here, which is a, it's a BGCM, and I have two users uh, that are logged into the same system. Um, the user on the left is would be called Dan, uh, and this, and Dan would be the person who is going to change the policies uh, and change the attributes and see the effects on how uh, SAP Dev, the user on the right. Uh, rights permissions change. So uh, real quickly, I wanted to show how the access is usually is set up uh, for SAP Dev uh, as well as uh, as well as Dan. So if I go into our friendly transaction code SC01 here, uh, I can show you guys that uh, there are no roles, but they are provisioned with SAP All and SAP New. And uh, the way, the reason we do this is uh, just for the purposes of the demo. And this is not required for the solution to work. But then uh, this is uh, this is to show you guys that any of the restrictions that are traditionally available through the SAP authorization policy uh, are now uh, are nothing is being stopped from SAP. So any uh, any particular stoppages or any particular events that occur on top of this are going to be from the policies that we set up uh, in, in terms of the attribute-based access controls. So that being said, uh, SAP All and SAP New uh, will not, um, is not required for the solution to work. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate that. So uh, going back, I just wanted to see, since Dan is our policy administrator and this will have uh, a new meaning uh, given GDPR constraints that, that most companies in Europe uh, and CCPA constraints that, that have been placed on, uh, on users in California uh, and companies in California specifically. Uh, so most of these companies, they have to safeguard uh, their users' information. And how we do it is we use the policy, which is basically a collection of attributes of the user uh, uh, who's actually accessing the, accessing the application. Uh, also, the uh, attributes of the data. For example, if you have uh, a, a folder that's that's 
restricted uh, and only certain people should use it. Uh, that's when the attributes can kick in and, uh, and, and make that particular access control decision for you. So the other thing, the last thing that I wanted to cover is also the context of the access. So what conditions exist at the time this access is taking place? Uh, is the company going through a denial of service attack, for example? Is the, uh, or any particular, uh, is the access from a unknown IP address or a blacklisted IP address, uh, et cetera? All those things we will see in, in, in the demo here. So, so once, so what I wanted to do is quickly show you what Dan would do in terms of adjusting the policy, right? So uh, this is what we call the policy. And so these are very simple transaction codes that are set up uh, for administrative purposes. And uh, so this is very akin to what your SAP security administrator or a designated uh, data protection officer would, uh, would see in terms of his access. So if you see here, there's, uh, this is the policy master that we have set up. So the way we set it up is basically for the transaction code that is in uh, scope. And so we wanted to enable either the transaction control, meaning that you have access to the transaction code or not. I want to stop the transaction from being accessed itself. Uh, and also the data control, which is the data within this particular transaction and how that can be, uh, that can be stopped, masked, et cetera. So I'll show you a couple of use cases here. Uh, that might actually uh, highlight that and provide more color to the topic. So if you uh, really look at it, and I use this example all the time, uh, RZ11 is one of our candidates here. Uh, it is set up as a transaction code uh, within our policy. And uh, RZ11 is, as most people from basics would know, it's a, uh, it's a password, it's a, it's a profile parameter transaction code where people can change how people log in, to the system, how long your password should be, how short it should be, should there be a password at all, uh, and all those things. So RZ11 is very sensitive transaction code, uh, only reserved for the basis team. So what happens if SAP Dev, the user on the right, goes into the uh, goes into the particular transaction code and tries to attempts to uh, get into it? Because uh, as you as you already saw, that SAP Dev, the user on the right, is provisioned with SAP All and SAP New. So uh, when he tries to go into RZ11, uh, through this policy, I can actually stop that particular access because that access is not authorized according to my transaction control policy set up here. Uh, and, uh, and so I can stop any, any, anybody at the, at the transaction code level itself. And if he belongs to a certain user group, only then I can allow uh, the RZ11 to go through vis-a-vis uh, -vis basis. So, uh, that is one particular use case where you can use transaction control to stop uh, stop a particular transaction, uh, uh, stop access. Uh, also, what I can do is uh, I, I can also show you what happens. Uh, and if, if you see, pay attention to the transaction code column here. Uh, we have all sorts of transactions. We have uh, standard SAP transactions that can be secured through this. We, can, we also have the Z transaction code that can be uh, secured. Uh, any reports uh, like the ZAPPL log details that can be secured as well. Uh, people running uh, companies that run SAP S4 uh, or Fiori will also have uh, can also see Fiori tiles here, which we can secure using the same uh, same concept. We we do not have any. There won't be any change except for the names would be the GUI IDs of that particular uh, of that particular uh, Fiori tile. So uh, going into uh, another specific use case, which is basically what happens when uh, uh, when this particular user tries to execute, uh, let's say a, a vendor transaction code, and he wants to display uh, a, the bank account details for a particular vendor. Uh, now, when we go in there, let me pick one vendor here. Uh, I'll pick the vendor USA. And if he wants to look at the, just the payment transaction code, uh, and <clears throat> So you'll see that I can mask portions of this particular uh, 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 bank account and account holder name, et cetera. Uh, any, any particular SAP uh, data element, data field that is available through any particular transaction within SAP, uh, I can actually go ahead and mask this. Now, how is this masking being implemented, right? Uh, you'll ask me, what is the, uh, what is the condition that, uh, that actually presents itself for this particular data element to be masked? So if I really go in and then I, uh, I will show you that the context of this access has been set up uh, wherein that a particular IP group, whether if this person is coming from the IP range 0.0.0.0 to 10.0.30.145, uh, I'm, I'm saying that this is my blacklisted IP. 
and I should not, nobody who's coming in from this particular IP address should see anything. Now, real quickly, you'll ask me, like, where is this guy logging in from, right? SAP Dev, uh, if I go into, uh, uh, let me show you the actual function module, which will give me that particular information. And if I go into and go uh, user score info, <clears throat> And if I display this particular uh, this thing and run this particular function module for SAP uh, that this particular user on the right, and what I can see is that he's coming from 10.0.30.141. Now this is basically my uh, blacklisted. IP. This falls within the blacklisted IP address, and henceforth uh, I'm I'm not showing any of this this thing. Alternatively, what I can do is also provide. Uh, a map, put a masking template on top of this so that the last four digits of the bank account are available or the bank key is available and the account holder is, is this thing. So any of the information in any of these particular data fields of SAP, I can, I can utilize this context to kind of uh, administer that. So let's quickly see what happens uh, if let's say I'm a data protection officer in Europe and uh, now suddenly uh, I say that my IP range is only till 139, and this user SAP Dev is coming from 141. Uh, so, uh, and this is how quickly I can change the policy, and I want you guys to pay attention to it. So, this range now not in, does not include the SAP Dev, the user on the right. So, if I go in and change it, uh, which is basically saving this, uh, and this would be saved, and then just as quickly as I can affect uh, the changes within the particular policy. And if I go in here and you'll see that the bank key and the bank account and account holder are all visible now, uh, just because I've, I've changed the uh, definition of what is a blacklisted IP uh, in my system. Uh, and that's, that's, how, uh, that's how complicated these use cases can get, but suffice it to say that any particular data element within SAP with well, belonging to any transaction, any Z transaction, any theory tile, uh, we can actually effectively mask. Uh, and this is all on top of uh, uh, the SAP system itself. So there's no separate system where you have to maintain a copy uh, like most of the other uh, tools. Uh, you're not creating any copy here. The, you're, this is operating on the source of truth, which is your SAP system. Um, that, that's the second use case. And this masking goes way beyond, you know, like, I, like I told you guys, that this can, uh, most of our clients use this for PII, for uh, anything that they consider IP which is intellectual property, like recipes, like uh, for example, a Coke would, would you know, want to guard its formula uh, uh, or an Airbus would try to uh, mask its uh, uh, bill of materials, what goes into a particular aircraft. Uh, so all of those things can be effectively masked. So now you'll ask me, okay, this is all fine, but what happens if the user tries to access uh, data within uh, SAP from like most uh, common data browser transaction codes, right? So what happens if, uh, let's say, SAP Dev here uh, goes into, let's say, C11, and then he's trying to, uh, let's say he's just been fired, and then he wants to get uh, um, get all the purchase order header information uh, from the company before he leaves. So he goes back to his desk, and then he's like, okay, fine, now let me get into the technical settings, and then I'm going to drop this table uh, and then take the table away. So uh, download the table and take the table away, right? So on, on the screen, you'll see that most of this data is now visible, but then I can, like I said, I can mask any of this uh, data uh, that's appearing on the screen itself also. Uh, but when we go into, let's say, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to like, uh, go into uh, downloading this particular information, I have deemed that my SAP EKKO table is actually restricted and it's, uh, it's sensitive information that I'm not going to allow anybody uh, to download. Uh, I can also put additional constraints saying that it should not, this download should not happen uh, uh, at, at a certain, after certain hours or a certain time of day or within, if it's coming from a certain IP address, et cetera, et cetera. All, all of my uh, policy attributes are based in here and then I just define one more attribute and then I can affect that particular condition uh, to get into the access control decision. So uh, this is how I can protect my sensitive data. Now, uh, and then quickly, the other thing that uh, that I can do is also uh, going. What if SE16? Now we did it this through this uh, SE11 transaction code, but when we go into SE16, 
And then let's say that I will take a different table just in case here. Uh, so let's take the material type table, which is Mara. And then uh, if, I, if I run this table, and you'll see that there's three entries here, one for uh, one with the material type FERT and the other with the material type VERP. And quickly to show you guys what these two mean, uh, my FERT, uh, this thing right here is a finished product and my VERP is the packaging materials. Now I can, I have deemed that my finished product is a highly sensitive uh, information. I should not have this uh, to be allowed to be downloaded, but then the packaging materials, I'm, I'm okay with people seeing this access. So uh, seeing this particular data element. So what happens if, I'm, if I try to download this table, right? Uh, and then I'm just gonna uh, do an unconverted uh, thing here. I'm gonna put it on the desktop and I'm gonna say uh, webinar, uh, Zero 02, and then let me generate this. Uh, now, if I go into my desktop and if I show you the particular file, uh, I'm just gonna use Notepad here. Uh, you'll see that only, I can allow only the packaging materials uh, to be downloaded and the, and the finished product is not downloaded. Uh, so I can place conditions uh, like these on, on most, of the, uh, most of the SAP data that's available this thing. So within, if you look at within roles, most of this data would be still visible via the 03 activity value. Uh, and you know you, you can actually uh, perform any, any particular downloads, et cetera. But any specific activity that is available within the uh, SAP system, uh, I can change the behavior based on the context and the uh, data attributes and the user attributes. Uh, so that being said, let me quickly go into another few use cases. Uh, I guess we're getting... Uh, really close on time. So uh, if I go into, uh, the other thing I can do is I can perform uh, business process controls using this uh, particular uh, attribute-based access controls concept. Uh, but when we talk about business process controls, uh, a lot of people will, uh, uh, will think about uh, maybe implementing a tool like SAP GRC PC, uh, which is a process control, uh, this thing allowed uh, that it is a very robust tool uh, that, but it's it's a very heavy tool in terms of maintenance, in terms of who accesses it, accesses it, and then who is also uh, um, working on it day to day. Uh, but if there was a simpler way to enforce these business process controls and policies through the policies, what we could do is we we could use the restriction like here on the on the uh, left. If you see Dan has uh, has the access to maintain net price. Uh, uh, and the price restriction is for around $10,000 for any POs. So let's see what happens if uh, SAP Dev, this user on the, on the right, goes in and uh, tries to release a particular uh, purchasing uh, uh, purchase uh, purchase doc. And then, so if you see that this is the one uh, purchase order that's greater than $10,000, and what happens if he tries to release it? <clears throat> He can be stopped uh, just because the, I have maintained that the allowed value is ten thousand uh, dollars, and this is basically to show you guys that uh, uh, any of the business process controls, uh, it could be release strategy, it could be pricing conditions, etc., can be simply uh, enforced through a line on your policy. It's that simple. Uh, instead of uh, using heavy tools that that that'll get you almost like uh, time to value for that for a GRC PC tool would be almost eight to 10 months uh, and testing uh, required for all those uh, workflows to, uh, to to kind of be tested and, and be proven. So here, just with one line, I can I can affect that particular release strategy. Uh, the second thing I can I can do is also uh, is also an advantage over SAP GRC, but then also any other uh, uh, GRC tool, which is basically to show you GRC tools mainly serve a, a, a big purpose in the in today's world. Uh, basically, they tell you exactly where contiguous business access, business function access uh, resides. If it resides in, within a role, if it resides, resides within the access profile buffer of, your, uh, of one particular user, uh, your reporting will tell you that this particular, hey, this guy has access to maybe create a purchase, uh, uh, a purchase order as well as do a goods receipt for that purchase order. So what happens here when I when I show you that? Uh, uh, let let's see how we can stop that, right? So there are these pesky controls that you struggle with in terms of enforcing that particular control. So uh, just letting you know that the access exists within the user buffer of the user, 
uh, is not enough anymore. So here, what we can do using attribute-based access controls is we can actually prevent that particular SOD. So let me quickly show you, uh, let me go into SC16. Uh, what I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna go back to the EKKO table, and I'm gonna see what are the particular purchase orders created by this user, SAP Dev, right? So if I run this particular uh, this thing query for SAP Dev, uh, these are all the particular purchase orders that this uh, user has created. Uh, now, if I, if I pick one of these, uh, these things, let's pick the 12, and then uh, what happens if this guy goes in and then he's trying to create a goods receipt for this particular purchase order that he himself has created, right? So uh, let us give it a one more second. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Uh, that there's quite a bit of latency in the system. But here, if I plug this in, and if he wants to create a goods receipt for that particular PO that he has created himself, uh, what I can do is I can actually stop him uh, using attributes because I am I'm able to read the attributes of the data itself, uh, which is basically the uh, purchase document number. So, uh, so whenever SAP Dev, it, it knows that SAP Dev has created this particular doc, document number, and I have created my policy to stop this SOD violation because he uh, he's the only he's the guy who's created it, and now he's going to create a, uh, a goods receipt for it. So so that is that is basically all of the uh, uh, these things that are available that I can uh, I can actually enforce attribute based access controls. Uh, now a definitive advantage here is uh, if you guys have uh, created and maintained your roles for uh, for this long time, and their roles are there's nothing wrong with roles. But uh, now, as Greg pointed out uh, in his presentation, that roles do not cut it anymore for uh, uh, for all of these uh, particular things, and they are a very heavy uh, uh, instrument to kind of wield uh, to make these changes. So uh, think about uh, taking a release strategy, for example. Just this release strategy for the business process, uh, we can. Uh, we can do it by one line in this policy here, but then if you'd go uh, creating a release strategy by by your roles, you would probably have uh, you'd have to set up maybe uh, uh, go with the requirement to your SAP security team. They'll construct the roles, and then you got to test it. Probably it would take you uh, almost three to four months to get that particular release strategy implemented in your production system. Uh, but here we can do it very uh, fairly quickly. So. Uh, that's pretty much all I had in terms of use cases to show you guys, and uh, I will welcome any questions that you guys have. Uh, please feel free to put it in the chat, and uh, uh, if, uh, and I'll try to answer them to the me and Greg will answer them to the best of you, uh, best of our ability. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Appreciate your uh, attention, and uh, back to you, Stephanie. I will take it. Thanks a lot, Adi. That was that was yeah. great. Um, so. Um, some of the additional use cases, and I know Adi went into a lot of them there, is, is you can really have additional controls across lots of different areas, whether that happens to be from a GDPR compliance, fraud and theft, data minimalization, or risk mitigation. Attribute-based access controls really give you the controls to put in place how you want your transactions and data accessed within your SAP system. So um, as you can see, it's... Uh, inside of the SAP system. So it allows you to extend and enhance the role-based control with Batflock. <coughs> Excuse me. So we do multiple different things, as you can see, and there's really a lot of advantages to why and what you're able to do with the Pathlock tool to help protect that data set. So um, by enhancing and extending the, the role-based access controls, you can better really you can really better meet the compliance requirements that are out there, whether it's Sarbanes, whether it's um, for defense organizations, whether it's data compliance, GDPR, PII, and you can reduce the cost of those audits and compliance as well, because you can also show what you were doing, which is going to cut down. You know, if you think about it from a GDPR perspective, who's accessed certain information? Well, if I'm masking or protecting that data, now I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to know every bit and piece of how somebody accessed that data, because a lot of times it could have been masked out and they're not looking at that data anyway. So it also allows you to integrate your data protection into your data processes in business processes throughout your organization. It truly allows that integration of policy in your procedures 
and your business rules into your SAP system to really help satisfy the corporate data security policies that you have in effect or what should be in effect now. So, um, and I'm always a huge favor of data minimalization. If the user doesn't need access to that data, really just take it away from them or they don't need to see it, you know? And, and I've dealt with ERP systems for, as I said, since the late nineties, you know, it's like 25 plus years. And it's always one of those things you could get a lot of kickback on. Well, I need to be able to see that. Why? What do you need that for? You don't need to see a, an employee social security number all the time or national ID. You know, it doesn't help you work with the record. You know, often not that data is not required for the transaction that you're working with anyway. So, you know, minimizing the data that they're going to be working with really cuts down on 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 your risk as well. Um, and it really shifts you from a reactive to a proactive data security um, implementation as well. So um, I'm going to open it up for Q&A. And as you can see, the Pathlock system uh, as a whole over on the right hand side. So if you do have any questions, just go ahead and submit them to the uh, go to webinar control panel there. Um, but the whole Pathlock system, we talked specifically about a few of them here today. You can see that it is uh, larger than what we just covered off on today. So um, Pathlock really brings to bear a very large solution for your SAP system. So with that, um, I'll leave the, the questions open for a little bit, but I'm going to throw it back to Stephanie so she can um, talk about some further announcements coming up. Thank you, Greg, and thank you, Adi. For your presentation. Um, yeah, we have a few announcements. Our first announcement is we have an event coming up called the Pathlock Virtual Innovation Series. That's going to be December 5th through the 8th. The, we would love you all to register and join. We have a bunch of partners, a bunch of other companies that are joining us to do presentations on everything from SAP to PeopleSoft to Oracle. Um, we have topics all over the board. So um, this would be a great opportunity for you to join and to listen in on upcoming things in those areas. Um, we also have a webinar coming up next week called Enhanced SAP Activity Tracking, Why It Matters. And that will be Thursday, November 10th at 10 a.m. Central Daylight Time. And if you would like to either register for that webinar or the innovation series, um, I encourage you to either join our email list or you can reach out to us at events at pathlock.com or you can go on social media and we post the registration links to all of this on our LinkedIn Pathlock page and our user group page. So um, there's a few places you can go. And with that, do we have any questions? Um, I don't see any questions for today, so um, I'll just wrap it up and say thank you all for coming, and we hope to see you at future webinar events.